economic uncertainty, rising geopolitical tension, social unrest and the loss of trust in government, institutions and leaders, all of this heightened anxiety only contributes to the ongoing sense of dread being experienced by ordinary people as we try to make sense of our lives in an increasingly uncertain world. I recently read a book, first published almost 30 years ago, which back then predicted much of what we are seeing unfold in the world today. These predictions weren't based on some psychic mumbo-jumbo or even paranoid doomsday pessimism, but on the perception of time, in sociological terms, as being cyclical rather than linear or random. A phenomenon the ancients understood very well, but that our civilization seems to have forgotten. The result has been skyrocketing levels of anxiety and spiraling levels of depression, along with the foreboding sense that things can only get worse, with no clear way out. Having read The Fourth Turning by Howe and Strauss, it seemed like a veil had been lifted from my eyes, and I suddenly began to feel less pessimistic about the future. So, in this video, I'm going to share the main premise and key takeaways from the book and hopefully give you a few reasons to feel less anxious yourself. Oh, and if you're a boomer or a Gen Xer, the bonus will be that you'll perhaps even get a couple of surprising insights into your own millennial and Gen Z kids. But before we begin, please take a moment to like and subscribe for updates. And if you enjoy our content, please click on the PayPal link in the description section below to leave a donation and help keep this unfunded educational channel going. Don't forget to share and leave a comment. And as always, thanks for watching. William Strauss, a government policy advisor, author and playwright, and Neil Howe, an economist, historian and demographer, were the founders of what is known today as the generational theory of history. They initially set out to tell the story of American history as a series of generational biographies. Both authors were interested in seemingly recurring patterns of history, and they studied the factors that may have been responsible. They weren't the first to consider the idea, but they focused on whether there were any behavioural characteristics within the ruling generation that could be seen as predictive. Psychologists often refer to these as archetypes. Howe describes the usual study of history in terms of a graph, with the x-axis representing time and the y-axis representing age. Most history is recorded by adults with a typical age bracket of around 50, and we tend to see history represented through time in terms of this purely horizontal expression. But Howe reminds us that each person is a product of what was happening in time during their childhood. In effect, they learn different life lessons depending on what they've lived through, which in turn influences the way they direct subsequent historical events. The authors contend that history realistically reflects an infinite number of diagonals of people who were kids at one point, matured at another, and became old at another point still later. The theory contends that a child born during war or severe recession and experiencing the deprivation, social constraints, and parental involvement that come with it would clearly turn out to be a different kind of adult than one born and raised during a time of spiritual renewal, individual freedom of expression, and anti-establishmentism. You may have heard the expression, hard times make hard men. Hard men make good times. Good times make soft men. And soft men make hard times. Generational theory could be thought of as a more complex and intricate expansion of that idea. So, people being born, raised, working, parenting and ageing during different particular times tend to develop a collective behavioural tendency. And it follows then that these tendencies lead to a set of repeating zeitgeists. This idea of recurring patterns something that is familiar to us in the old cliché of history repeating itself, 
is a characteristic of what Howe and Strauss call a cyclical view of human history. This much older narrative is opposed to the prevailing view that history is simply composed of an infinite number of random, unpredictable series of events that, while consequential, are nevertheless linear and progressive. They point out that the problem with the linear view of time is that the domino effect of amplifying consequences or effects leads us to a much more nihilistic and doomsday-like view of the future, the uncertainty of unpredictability, and as a result, greater anxiety and a heightened sense of urgency to act and exert control upon the world. The hubris of mankind's attempt at suppression and control whether it be over the passage of time, on economics or the cyclical patterns of nature, eventually leads to the tragedy of a greater backlash down the road. In our civilization, the critical shift in time perception is thought to have occurred with the adoption of Judeo-Christian theology that is premised on an apocalypse and an ultimate reckoning. This was in total contrast to the world of the ancients, who viewed life and time much differently, whether it be in Europe, Asia or the Americas, where both vast and short cycles of calendrical time were believed to occur. As the regularity of the seasons dominated their existence, it was only natural that they saw all things as operating within a kind of seasonality. It's thought that the universality of this idea largely stems from the agricultural focus of all the great ancient cultures that were dependent upon the seasons, annual floods, snow melts and animal migrations that their livelihoods depended on. With the ascendancy to power of nomadic shepherd cultures and their non-agricultural religions in the Middle East, things slowly began to shift with Christianity and later Islam sealing the fate of cyclical ideas of history with their messianic agenda. Now all we have left are clichés and aphorisms that point to that time long ago when people believed everything comes full circle. Even today, many of us instinctively feel a connection to the idea of cyclical time, which is possibly one reason why Howe and Strauss's books became bestsellers for such a long time. So with this cyclical and agriculturally based view of time, it can be useful to apply the analogy of the seasons to civilization, as it moves through its own four similar phases in a cycle that lasts approximately the span of a long human life, or in more elegant terms, the complete renewal of a human population, roughly 80 to 100 years. Each phase or season then lasts between 20 and 25 years. This social cycle isn't arbitrary. Howe and Strauss claim it was well known to the ancients, with the Etruscans and Romans in Italy referring to it as a saculum. In their world, a saculum was the period from the moment a significant event occurred to the point that the last person who experienced it died. It was even believed that the gods had determined a fixed number of saecula to a given civilization. The Etruscans believed that they were given ten, after which they would be replaced by a new civilization. Similarly, the ancient Aztecs and Mayans believed their time was up at the coincidental time their calendars aligned with the arrival of the Spanish conquistadors. The cycle's four phases were defined as a high, followed by an awakening, which was then followed by an unraveling, and finally a crisis, which would then be followed by a new high, and so on. The authors point out that they drew their inspiration for the generational theory from a long line of historians and social scientists, such that their observations are hardly controversial, though critics have occasionally said that this theory is difficult to falsify and easy to cherry-pick. For their part, the authors agree that the factors influencing a seasonal phase can be complex and multifactorial such that a phase may last longer or shorter than the typical time of 22 to 25 years, particularly now where technology comes into play, 
So let's begin by first looking at the phases and their characteristics. Then we'll move into the social archetypes that are both shaped by and themselves then later shape the transition or turning of the phases. So let's begin with the spring, which is referred to as the first turning or a high. In this phase, the Zeitgeist is one of optimism and social cohesion, a sense of belonging. There is a general can-do attitude and a flourishing of activity, civic responsibility and a high social order, with conformity being socially rewarded. People have confidence in the integrity and competence of their leaders and a compliance that is generally high. Leadership is dominated by midlifers who tailor social policy accordingly and cement the regime into public consciousness. People do as they are expected to do. Duty is important. Gender roles and distinctions, family commitment and community spirit is strong. There is little tolerance for dissenting views, for minorities and subcultures who are often suppressed and expected to conform with the widespread use of shaming to ensure the prevailing cultural paradigm. While not essential to this phase, generally American and Western society has seen a boom time in economic prosperity, with new infrastructure projects and housing affordability, jobs, savings and working class progress. This sense of confidence makes for much less protective parenting with children allowed to roam freely, play and explore without too much parental interference. Indeed, they become so accustomed to both indulgence and affluence that they become bratty and selfish. Societal progress is rapid, confident, collective and conformist, but the downside is a lack of individuality and personal expression. The second turning, referred to as the awakening, is the summertime of a saculum. It's a period of euphoria and self-discovery, as the children born and spoiled during a high start to become defiant, self-absorbed young adults. This self-discovery begins to highlight the growing awareness of differences between people. Many individual differences that were strongly repressed or viewed as pathological during the high begin to adversely affect them emotionally, and many of them begin to suffer the long-term effects of shame at having to suppress their individuality. Others begin to agitate for change, embracing their uniqueness and direct that shame towards the culture that repressed them. Young people leave home as soon as they can, so oppressively do they see living with their parents. Writers, artists and other creatives begin to hold up a mirror to society while others yet begin to rebel, elevating the status of the individual's rights above the order of the group. Of course, the existing regime doesn't take this lying down and governments typically double down on control measures with a peak in repressive power. As is typical in adolescence, defiance and rebellion becomes the focus of social activity. Non-conformity is celebrated as cultural values begin to be overturned. Gender distinctions now begin to narrow as the existing order, its restrictions and its power structure is criticized by proponents of anti-establishment ideology. Children born to parents during this phase experience a significant decline of parenting and protection as values shift from emphasis on the sanctity of the family to the self-discovery of adults who pay far less attention to the development of their children than in the pursuit of their own free expression. Eventually, all the agitation, rising non-conformity and social change leads to the third turning of a society in what might be called its autumn time. Now we start to see a fragmentation from the ground up of the family, communities, public institutions and government as distrust in authority and the existing regime, now over half a century in situ, becomes widespread. The zeitgeist becomes more anxious and cynical as civic order begins to decay. 
Depression and anxiety are entrenched as certainty evaporates and people begin to feel the lack of family and community cohesion. Dominant individualist value systems emerging from the awakening phase take root and establish themselves as the new cultural authority. The preceding power structure becomes increasingly impotent as the can-do attitude of previous decades is replaced by can-be attitudes. Guilt, both individually and collectively, peaks, with repression and social credit now moving the other way, where individuality, diversity and principles are rewarded and previously conformist citizens become publicly shamed instead. Midlifers are powerful in culture rather than politics, with continuous public debate over the ends rather than the means. Gender roles and distinctions are at their narrowest, while parenting now becomes increasingly protective with children subject to much greater adult influence. Finally, we come to the fourth turning, or the crisis, which is the winter season of society that represents death and a purging of excess, suffocating growth. In this phase, some catastrophic event occurs, whether geopolitical, environmental or economic, though often they are intertwined. The deregulation, impotence of political will and economic sensitivity in the unravelling phase leaves society vulnerable to the shocks of a crisis, with nobody left alive or too old to serve who had survived the last crisis to guide society through the next one. It's important to note that no fourth turning in American history in particular has ever occurred without the onset of total war. It's also important to observe, however, that preceding this external aspect of a crisis, there was always a corresponding internal conflict of ideas that have become increasingly polarised on many issues, so the citizens now begin to turn on one another. When an external threat does emerge, it usually serves to re-galvanise citizens into a much more unified body than had existed in the previous decades. The crisis necessitates widespread suffering across many strata of society, with a perception of direct threat to the survival of the nation. There is a consequential demand for strong leadership, order and unity to restore stability and community purpose. It's a time of survival that necessitates a coming together in groups and action to create a new civic power structure. Pragmatic solutions begin to be implemented to solve problems, which results in redefining political, community and family relationships. Gender distinctions begin to widen again as society begins to look for greater security once more. This affects the raising of children, with parents and society becoming overprotective and helicoptering, dominating their upbringing as one of the few things left in their control. Crises and awakenings represent the two alternating periods of historic upheaval that are recognised as defining moments within a framework of a saculum. The crisis is the point of major secular upheaval, where the external or material world is reorganised through uniformity, consensus, order and personal sacrifice. The awakening is the counterpoint of major cultural change or religious upheaval, which shifts a civilizational emphasis onto the inner or spiritual world that promotes individuality, subjective experience and personal values. This is often where you see the emergence of great religious leaders or religious reforms. So now that we've taken a look at the general mood that pervades each of the four turnings or phases, we need to also take into account the way these moods affect people at different times in their lives. Howe and Strauss identify four generational archetypes based on their adult characteristics that repeat during each saculum. Each of them are influenced by different conditions that pervade society during their formative 
young adult years, and they take these characteristics into their more mature years as they take on leadership responsibilities within their society. The Hero Hero generations are born during an unravelling, where individualism is maximum and government trust is at a minimum. They experience increased meddling in their childhood development by nomad parents, wanting to shield them in what they see as a challenging future, hoping to pass on pragmatic skills they learned in their own lives. This degree of overprotectiveness of the parents makes the hero generation somewhat entitled and just expecting things to happen for them. The corollary of this is a corresponding burden of social responsibility and an expectation for them to achieve something as adults. During an unravelling, there is an element of every man for himself, which can make them yearn for a connection with community or mankind in general. So they tend to embrace utopian ideologies where everyone gets along and everyone is happy and we all save the world. Of course, they have no idea how to achieve this and it's not till their later adulthood that they actually pick up that burden. But they are great team players and this is one of their great strengths. When successful, they can become pompous and prone to hubris, while their continuous activism and community immersion leads them to age eventually into powerful political and entrenched leaders that become the target of the next awakening. Recent examples include the Greatest Generation, or the GI Generation, born from 1902 to 1924 who shouldered the burden of both fighting World War II and reconstructing a new world order afterward. Their contemporaries in the coming saculum are the Millennials, born from about 1982 to 2004. We'll talk a bit more about them later. The Artist Generation The Artist, or Adaptive Generation, are those born during the flux and transformation of a crisis, which sees a pruning and disintegration of complex social policies in favour of simple, urgent, solution-oriented action, emphasising personal sacrifice for the greater good. As children, they are overprotected by anxious adults hunkering down to survive a prolonged crisis, and so enter their young adulthood as repressed conformists during the post-crisis high. This excessive helicoptering by either nomad or hero parents robs them of the organic development that would normally occur if they had the freedom of an unstructured environment. As young adults, they experience higher levels of anxiety and indecisiveness because they rarely had an opportunity to fail, learn and fail again as kids. Nevertheless, this also confers a more sensible attitude to life, and they tend to be far more risk-averse than their parents. Moreover, they have a greater interest in learning, are empathic and less inclined to criminal activity. They take their place in midlife as process-oriented leaders during the next awakening, where they prefer to leave things as they are and warn against making too many changes. This resistance makes them ineffective as leaders and a target of their maturing children. As elders, they often become sombre, conciliatory and thoughtful as they reflect on the disintegration and uncertainty of their society during the twilight or autumn of their own lives. It's a hell of a thing killing a man. This, in our saculum, was the silent generation, born between 1925 and 1942 and in the coming saculum are the Gen Z generation, born from 2005 to 2025. The Prophet Prophets are overindulged and often spoiled brats who are born during a high and its rejuvenated community life and social order. They benefit from the material wealth and stability of the post-crisis era, eventually transforming into the idealistic crusaders of the coming awakening. Benefiting from free education, their saturation in materialist comfort as children feeds a narcissistic self-importance, which in turn feeds their defiance to authority and an egocentric need to lecture others and boss them around. 
they go on to become social moralists in their midlife, and then, as they become older, they tend to be the only ones still thinking about moral values, or the big picture. Bigger than life, they often achieve cult status, resistant to criticism. As they age, their idealism lends a degree of broad thinking, and sometimes wisdom, that inspires the younger hero generations that need to shoulder the transition into a new crisis. But at other times, their arrogance makes them unpopular with later generations. Most recently, these are the baby boomers, born between the end of World War II and 1960. The Nomad Taciturn, laconic and thought of as doers, nomads are born during an awakening, where social ideologies are challenged and spiritual revival begins. They spend their childhood without much parental supervision, becoming independent, resourceful and consequently alienated from the establishment in their adolescence. As young adults, they become cynical rather than idealistic attackers of the established order and they have a greater appetite for personal risk than the previous generations in their pursuit of financial reward. Their tendency to solve their own problems and manage their own needs makes them pragmatic midlife leaders during a crisis, and they age into resilient and often condescending post-crisis elders. Most recently, these are the Gen Xers, born between 1961 and 1981, and their vanishing great-grandparents who survived World War I and the Great Depression, but whose stories of survival they only hear in TV documentaries. They were often the competent midlife commanders of World War II battles. Their pragmatic, rapid and imaginative solutions on the battlefield contrasted significantly with that of the ageing commanders left over from the First World War, who have often been criticised for lacking adaptability and creativity. The prophet and hero are considered to be the dominant archetypes when they reach midlife, and politics reflects their more aggressive attitudes. The prophet attacks institutionalised power structures to facilitate personal and spiritual independence, while the hero attacks and rebuilds the decaying political power structure in response to an external threat to the nation or community. The artist and nomad, on the other hand, are the recessive archetypes that bridge the two transformative periods. The nomad just wants to be left alone to go about their own business, while the artist wants everyone to just get along. Both the nomad and the artist see their respective storms coming, but while the nomad puts on his helmet, the artist tries to negotiate compromises. If you've paid any attention at all to the turnings described so far, it'll be pretty obvious to you that we are more or less in the middle of a crisis period. The book was written in the mid-90s, remember, so the authors were, at the time, totally unaware of the current pandemic, let alone Brexit, the GFC, Trump, and the now growing antagonism of China, among many other things. Howe has had a number of interviews since then, and I'll put some links to those videos I found interesting in the description section below. Let's take Gen X as an example, which are classified as nomads. If we look at the crisis column, which is the current time, you'll see that nomads occupy the row that places them as being middle-aged, in their 40s and 50s. Gen Xers, in their contemporary stance, are characterised by Howe as being rather cynical, pragmatic and generally suspicious of cultural diversity, and they yearn for a return to national unity, family values and neighbourhood bonding, perhaps to compensate for their own abandonment syndrome as kids, but also perhaps to recapture some of that suburban neighbourhood street freedom they also enjoyed. They're beginning to come to terms with their own mortality and want to cushion and secure themselves for the coming storm, keeping family close by. They appreciate the passion shown by millennials, but they often see it as disproportionate to their common sense, which, along with fortitude, they think is seriously lacking. The leadership of the present crisis will be largely commanded by Gen Xers with their no-nonsense and pragmatic attitude to problem-solving. 
They are the George Washingtons and Ulysses S. Grants of the crisis, whose solutions may not be elegant, they may not make everyone happy, but they'll get the job done, and they'll have to lean on the millennials to see it through. If we go back a column to the unravelling of the late 80s, 90s and early noughties up to the GFC in 2008, we, speaking for myself, were young adults, just getting out of university, starting families and settling down. It was the time of big hair, androgynous boy musicians, the breakup of the Soviet Union and Yugoslavia, emergence of the EU, decoupling from the gold standard, Wall Street sharks, the recession we had to have, the end of apartheid, the intifada. It was also the time of celebrity mania and distraction through mass entertainment and the war on drugs that basically represent a facet of that distraction. The era was punctuated by the rise of international terrorism, hostages and bombings culminating in 9-11. We became increasingly turned off by politics, but at the same time enjoyed a degree of autonomy and personal freedom that saw minimal government meddling in our lives. Go back a column still more and you can see we were born in the full swing of the early 60s to early 80s. It was the time of cultural revolution, the great awakening, social unrest, student protests, civil rights, gays coming out, feminism, the contraceptive pill and free love. It was the time of Woodstock and marijuana, Vietnam protests, LSD, environmental activism and hippie spirituality. It's a wonder any kids ever got fed or went to bed on time and most didn't. The Gen Xers, who were then kids, were lumped in front of TVs or left to their own devices with TV dinners while their dads worked ever longer hours and their mums found greater freedoms to enter the workforce for themselves. Despite the pervasive utopianism, social agitation and repudiation of conformity, family life suffered and divorce rates skyrocketed such that many kids grew up either in single parent families or basically roaming the streets. This period saw the rise of the welfare state, but it also saw the collapse of colonialism across the third world, as bankrupt imperialist states found it cheaper to relinquish power over their now resource-drained dominions than to maintain them. But it was also a time of economic revolution, deregulation and fiscal experimentation that stimulated the onset of the Reagan-era economic snowball. And if you go back to the first turning, or post-war high, you can see that the nomad occupies the elderly row. This was the post-World War II era of the birth of their parents, the baby boomers, during the time of Truman, Eisenhower and Kennedy. A period of huge optimism, but little individuality or cultural creativity. It was a time of record low crime rates and high social discipline. The baby boomer generation enjoyed a high standard of living, one parent incomes sufficient to live comfortably, and the consequent attentiveness, coddling and spoiling that we now see repeated in the homeland or Gen Z generations. I'll get back to them in a minute. So for the coming high, due to start somewhere around 2030, we Gen Xers will be moving into our 70s and beyond. Will it be a comfortable old age? Who can tell? But how reassures us that old Gen Xers are tough enough to take it, and we're used to taking care of ourselves anyway. Maybe this is a good time to now look briefly at the end of the present saculum in a little bit more detail, to see what Howe and Strauss make of them, before taking a brief look at Howe's assessment moving forward into the next one. So Howe relates that a crisis goes through four subphases. The initial phase is the crisis trigger a catalyst such as the GFC in our time, or its parallel stock market crash in 1929, when there was a shock to our system and a sudden recognition that the whole world as we know it was not going to be the same again, and that fundamental changes in our philosophy were not only necessary but urgent. Families became increasingly aware that they weren't going to achieve the same levels of prosperity as their parents did. This period is then followed by the regeneracy, which is where we begin to rally around a leader or a movement that seeks to redress the social failures that led to the crisis. 
The climate change agenda, pushback against globalization, the rise of ethical investing, welfare and income inequality reform, gay marriage laws, all of these issues often highlight a complete breakdown in trust in government and a high political volatility. Massive popular movements emerge that seek to drastically alter our direction, which gives us a ray of hope and trust in the future. The next subphase consists of additional shocks that keep adding damage into the already vulnerable civilization, but it necessitates a radical retooling of public institutions as well as laws to cope with the fallout of events that we were completely unprepared for. An example might be the pandemic, the Great Economic Reset, or an external political crisis such as China taking Taiwan, or Russia taking Ukraine. All of these events together lead to the climax where the system is now at its weakest, but which starts to see an increased coming together of people for the coming good, and the implementation of bold, innovative and often controversial strategies to stabilise the crisis. At some point, the final stage called the resolution is reached, where stability is achieved and a new social order emerges that now remains stable for the next several decades, as the weary population begins to make the most of it and entrusts their power to the government to maintain order. What will this be for us moving forward? That's anyone's guess, but suffice to say, it will involve institutionalising elements of the shocks we are now seeing. A further note on millennials. The early part of this group were just coming of age around the time of the GFC, while the tail end of them are coming of age now during the pandemic. So the entire generation has been hit by both economic and existential crisis, just as they're entering their young adult phase, where we are all very ideologically impressionable. Consequently, we see in them the development of a greater awareness of the need to belong to a community, on behavioural appropriateness, risk aversion and visionary personal investment in the future through pushing environmentally friendly policies and economic fairness. Howe and Strauss identify seven core characteristics of millennials as the coming saculum's heroes and they are listed as being special, sheltered, confident, team-oriented, conventional, pressured, and achieving. They are living at home with their parents on an unprecedented level, with all of the relationship challenges that brings. They lack the defiance of boomers and the self-dependence of Gen Xers. They increasingly feel like the current system of liberal democracy is failing them, as they are forced to come to terms with their increasingly falling behind their parents. Most boomers and Gen Xers today would roll their eyes at the suggestion that millennials are the next hero generation, being coddled and preoccupied with champagne socialism more than getting their hands dirty or saving money. But Howe points out that their substantial participation in politics has been astonishingly rapid as well as passionate compared to that of young people in preceding decades where nobody really cared much about getting involved and instead focused solely on wealth acquisition and personal achievement. We also see millennials, more than any other group, coalescing into tribal groups to pursue ideological agendas and political parties responding with a definite shift to populism and polarisation to attract their votes. How sees them over the next decade as increasingly taking responsibility for the economic direction of their society. They will eventually be forced to walk the talk, however, and they are expected to bring community, solidarity and a new public order about. The Gen Z generation, the first to be entirely immersed in computer technology from the day they were born, though more anxious and fearful than millennials, are the most ethnically and racially diverse generation in history. Their mostly Gen X parents have taken advantage of increased science, literature and the internet to give them programs of development that cover emotional as well as academic spheres, more so than the millennials they may have parented. 
Gen Z adults will be far more risk-averse than millennials and far more compliant, but are expected to contribute their vast capacity for empathy to smooth over the transition from crisis to high and use their technological skills in dealing with fine details to help the new emerging order run more smoothly. They will be the mandarins or bureaucrats of the new world order and will make their mark behind the scenes where it's safe to do so. Unfortunately, this timidity sees them as having greater dependence on medication as they'll be more prone to mental health issues that prevent them from full personal expression and freedom. How much of that are Gen Xers to blame for? Hard to say, but the best we can do is encourage them to express themselves as freely as they want and to give them opportunities to voice their thoughts, otherwise they may never reach their full civic potential into the future. Well, there you have it, perhaps a longer and more meandering review than I first set out to do, but I thought it was important to try and tie in several threads that relate to us personally into this theory of history, and I hope you got some nuggets of value from it. The theory does have its critics, and it risks overgeneralizing in a number of ways, but that's always the risk with generalizations. For myself, one of the feelings that emerged upon reading the book was that the end is not nigh. What we are going through is part of a natural cycle, and the players have all been here before. Essentially, I felt a bit more optimistic, and that's something we can all do with right now. It's clearer to me that much of what amounts to political rhetoric is typical for this point in the cycle, and I felt reassured that after the winter, spring will come once again. It also prompted me to check my Gen X propensity for being Mad Max and to view millennials and Gen Z kids with a little bit more charity, having picked up a few lessons on how to temper my own opinions and make room for their point of view. As a single dad, that might just turn out to be invaluable. I hope it is for you too. Till next time, walk tall. Cheers.